Um, yeah, hi and welcome to my talk labeled Neural Process Models of Intentionality. And uh, this talk will sort of bring some stuff back that Gregor already talked about on Wednesday and repeat that a little bit, but hopefully that won't be boring, but rather sort of aid your understanding. And we'll also, of course, show some new stuff and a little bit also the direction that we're going in with higher cognition in our group uh, right now. So in order to, to put this in a little bit of perspective, I wanted to highlight sort of the different spectrums of DFT models that you've maybe seen in the school and that were developed over the time. So it all basically started with these models that try to capture psychophysical data in the lab. The most notable or most famous here is probably this A not B model by Thalen and Gregor uh, from 2001 here. And that was a really one of these kinds of models that only has one field and maybe a memory trace, but it's not really a field architecture, but it was modeling the data quite well in the lab and also become quite famous for that was sort of the first idea for some kind of these neural process models. And what we've then done recently in our lab, more and more, also many or master students are doing that right now, is doing models that capture sort of one behavioral competence, whether it is reaching or it's spatial language understanding or even scene representations. All of these, they are sort of capturing one behavioral competence. And one feature that we always strived here for was this thing autonomy, right? autonomy, right? So that uh, these architectures, given some input and given maybe some output, could then behave on their own and achieve a goal. Uh, also, then maybe with noise in the input or the output. And having all these different models then leads to more and more cognitive architecture type modeling, sort of. So that at some point we just model thought like, okay, if we have like all these different behavioral con competences, cannot we then integrate them all? to really build an intentional agent that goes around the world and, and acts in some way. And sort of this here was one of the first projects or maybe the first project that tried to integrate them all to, to uh, actually get through an acting agent. And I will go step by step through this uh, from now. But maybe I should first explain what an intentional agent actually is. So what do we mean by that? And I think Gregor pulled this already up in his lecture uh, on Wednesday. So it's a term from philosophy that actually just means something like the capacity of the nervous system to generate mental states that are about things in the world. So that's a very, very general capacity. And some philosophers argue that that is actually just consciousness in a way, because when you're consciousness of something, you are conscious, you're referring to something that you're conscious about, right? So that's basically all our conscious thinking is the one form of intentionality. And then the, you could have like endless philosophical debates on how that's possible and what that entails. But that given that we are sort of a cognitive, more on a cognitive side and neural side, we are of course interested in, in different questions regarding intentionality. And these questions are first, of course, how can intentional states actually emerge from neural processes? And once we have them, how can we stabilize these states in time sort of you can probably think about where this is going. And then also under which circumstances when we have stable representations, when we can we let go of them and destabilize them again? So these very fundamental questions here that are about representation and how we can represent them neurally, but with this time factor. So in the process model view here. But still this whole intentionality thing is way too general. So we need to boil this down further to, to get a concrete project out of this. And we looked here at the work of the philosopher John Searle, who had sort of a very logical and clean approach on intentional states. And the first thing he says about intentional states that they have two components. One is the content of the intentional state and the other is the psychological mode. That would be the way in which you refer to the content, right? Content could be something like the red flower and then there are multiple ways to uh, refer to such the red flower. And, uh, Looking at the psychological mode, he even uh, sort of divided them in two directions of fit. I think Gregor already mentioned that on Wednesday. And then for each of direction of fit, he sort of stated three archetypical psychological modes. So what is meant by direction of fit? Well, the idea is basically there between action and perception. So the world to mind direction of fit is sort of the action way. 
where you think about your mental representation being something in your mind and the world should change to the mind, right? So if you want to pick a flower, you first have an image in your mind that you want to pick the flower and then you change the world by moving your hand, right? A bit drastic, but that's how you do what you do. <laughs> Whenever you move your body, <laughs> you change the world. Uh, and well, the other way would be more the perceptual flavor. So here you would say, the world is in some way and I want my mind to change so that I represent it accurately. So if I have something in front of me, I then form a representation in my mind. So in this way, the mind changes to the world. And then uh, given like action and perception, here's then different ways of abstracting for that. On the one hand, that would be a temporal abstraction. So from having one action, you could have a prior intention, so the action plan. And even more general, you could have a desire. That's something very abstract, where not even a concrete action plan is connected to it. And then on the perceptual side, you again have this temporal abstraction here. So you could think of a perception in the past that would then be a memory. And you could even have a more abstract uh, representation here, which uh, he calls then belief, um, which we interpret as sort of a general rule for, for example, red flowers have a green stem, could be one of these beliefs. And there's maybe also the first difference between philosophers and us, uh, that uh, philosophers would think of belief also of things that are connected to a single thing. Uh, I could believe that my dog is probably lying outside of this door. Um, but generally, we uh, want to see the belief here as a general property, a contingency of the world, because that makes it much simpler later also in modeling to have the clear distinction between belief and memory. Okay, but what kind of what is all this all these uh, directions of fit uh, and these psychological modes what does it mean to have a process model of these and the process that is happening here is really connected to these first three questions that i mentioned so for example for perception the process that's going on is we have here our agent donald he's looking in the direction of the flower and then the process would be that he starts to form an accurate more or less representation of this flower in the world that would sort of be the process of perception go from nothing to something. And similarly for intention and action, it's the other way around. So here Donald has first a representation of how the world should be, namely that he has the flower in his hand while the world is not like that. But then of course, Donald can just reach out and sort of change the world so that actually his mental representation fits to the uh, representation in the world right now. So that's where this direction of fit comes from. And whether this fit is achieved or not, this is what Searle calls the condition of satisfaction. So that is a term you also heard at least Wednesday, if not even more. So this is where this comes from, from this philosophical term, where the mind and world actually fit together. And to put this more in a neural process model, and here I switch slowly to DFT, is in this model by Sanomirskaya and Schöner from 2010, which was sort of this idea of having a, a condition of satisfaction representation of action sort of. So this is basically the process model for intention and action. And because that's so uh, yeah, important to the project, I will go through this once more in detail. I think Gregor spent a long time on this, but I will bother you with it again, twice the charm, right? So the whole uh, model here has two nodes in the top. One is the intention node that signals sort of that your action is starting and the other would be the condition of satisfaction node that signals that your action is finished, has reached its desired state. The fit between world and mind is achieved. And uh, let's think of this as maybe realizing some arbitrary action, for example, moving our hand from the right to the left. And uh, then we would receive from our sensor surface our current hand position, which would be to the right, and we want to move it to the left, right? So uh, at this moment in time, the intention would start by an external activation of this intention node that would then evoke a peak here in the desired state field. And this peak would now mean in our simple interpretation, the desired state is that the hand is on the left. And uh, in some way, this is then forwarded to the motor surface and somehow realizes this movement from uh, right to left. But regarding this network here, what this also does is it forwards the desired state directly to this condition of satisfaction field here, right? So the left peak here, or it's not a peak, basically. What, what this is meant to be is 
it's sub threshold activation right these two well this is above threshold um, so we have the low threshold activation here from the sensory surface because our hand is actually at the right and we have below threshold activation at the left here because this is where we want to go and then through thermal action at the motor surface this hand will actually move closer and closer to our goal and once these overlap when we reach this goal a peak will form here because these two overlap that's also something you, you did in your exercise and then connected to this field is the condition of satisfaction node that activates it detects sort of this change that now here we have a match and then because it has an inhibitory connection back to the intention node it will turn this off right so automatically that's sort of the the clue of having these autonomous transitions and because the intention node is now uh, deactivated there will be no peak here anymore in the desired state field and so after a brief amount of time this red uh, input here will also vanish this will also then cause the deactivation of the condition of satisfaction node and we are back in the beginning the system sort of self reset itself to its initial state the only difference is that the hand is now in the left position instead of the right so that is sort of this 2010 model and um, could be already is already the model of intention and action basically so now we need to introduce all the other psychological modes and here we thought of a scenario that you maybe have seen already and that is this robot here living in this world with these uh, different colored blocks and the task of this robot here is to take color from these long blocks and then apply it to these small blocks here and then they will change some color and the idea is that the robot over time also learns these color combinations something like okay if i take purple and apply it on blue then i receive yellow for example and uh, yeah, the idea was we wanted to have some minimal experiment or one minimal scenario where we can include all these six psychological modes that Searle was speaking of. And um, this was also then turned out to be a good be, uh, environment sort of for autonomous learning because we have sort of all these intentional state representations. And you can think of these stabilized intentional state representations really as experience that we can use then to learn and what we really will learn here are these beliefs about the colors um, but yeah uh, to go into uh, through this in more detail just want to sort of uh, gloss over all these states that this agent can have all these intentional states so the perceptual states are pretty straightforward so the agent can sort of see these cubes right he has a very small camera here in the front and sees therefore only two or three cubes at a time uh, it can observe color changes, so it has a transient detector that whenever color changes here, it, it notices that, uh, like in its field of view. And it can sense sort of its own location in the world, sense where its arm is, and it senses sort of if it has collected paint or not. Uh, this painting device you cannot see, it's just uh, virtually simulated. Uh, it has also uh, a memory of all the objects in the space here. And that's very important, right? Because the robot can only see at any point in time only a very uh, small portion of the environment, uh, but it can sort of memorize all the other locations. And then it has these beliefs that I already talked about that are always of the same structure. A coat color plus some canvas color gives you some result color, but more on this uh, in the end. Then it has um, intentions in action. It can move in this 1D space. Yeah, I know this world looks very fancy, but the robot is actually just moving from left to right. It has these funny wheels here that allow to do it. And uh, it can reach for these objects here, or at least reach towards them and pick up and dispense color then in the simulated world here. And it can invoke certain mind to world states. What is, what is meant by that? It can sort of uh, invoke a certain perception by visually searching for a purple object it can sort of invoke a perception of a purple object or it can invoke a memory by recalling it right or it can invoke a belief by cueing that belief um, then it has some prior intentions that are basically sort of uh, action plans that are unfolding right so in order to really do the painting it has to first collect color and then apply color somewhere and in between it has to locate these objects so these will uh, all be modeled as prior intentions. And then it has a very, very simple desire here. and That's certainly the least developed part of the project. It has sort of a desire to create one color like, and has then to try and find out which kind of uh, matching blocks it needs to create that color. 
And this is sort of an overview of the architecture, but I will only highlight uh, certain spots. And from this sort of uh, yeah, colorful picture, maybe just look at the different uh, headlines here. So at the bottom, we have a sensory motor surface that's then connected to, on the one hand, fields that are belonging to visual perception, and then on the other side, fields that belong to an intentional action. And all these fields sort of re realize here or are sort of the entry point for one of these actions that I just mentioned. Then we have memory fields and prior intention fields here, or nodes rather that guide these prior intentions. And in the top, we have sort of the belief network that's about learning beliefs. That will be sort of the focus of the last part of the talk that I will go into detail. And then we have here on the top right, the desire. That's sort of the, the cause for all the things the agent is doing, right? So it has only outgoing connections here in this picture. But of course, there's also a conditional satisfaction field for, for that desire. Um, but yeah, first things first, we just go maybe through each of these uh, psychological modes and uh, highlight a few features about them. So uh, what I should do first is I should translate for you that you can read the plots <laughs> that are about to follow. I should sort of tell you how we converted the activation from the camera image to the field, right? And I hope you've seen these kind of two-dimensional fields by now that sort of associate space with some feature dimension. So here, these are two kinds of this. So the one is the space color map, that is retinal space versus color. And the other is the retinal space and height map. So it's retinal space where this height. So here you can see you have three objects. One is purple, two are yellow. So here is the purple object. And then to the, these two objects are yellow. While we have two small objects and one tall one. So here at the small height label, we have two. And at the uh, larger height value, we have one object. And then we, of course, have also a salience representation that where are objects in space? It's basically projected one of these two maps down to one dimension only. Uh, so just so that these are familiar to you. And the process model of perception is then how what we would interpret, as you have seen probably in Raoul's talk, is sort of attending an object because only then you can extract its features and sort of compare it, for example, in a visual search task. So to perceive something uh, with this agent, it has sort of this, this retinal color map uh, here. So the left-hand side is before the perception, right? There is nothing selected here, but in the right-hand side, uh, one object is selected intentionally. This is why this is circled with red here. And this then yields sort of an, a ridge that goes into this retinal color select field. And this way, we will sort of select only left object and can then read out its feature value, in this case, blue, right? So I think there's a mechanism you've seen plenty of times by now. And uh, what you've seen by now is these four fields here of the whole uh, scene representation architecture that is actually just a simplified version of Raoul's big 3D uh, architecture. And this is simplified because it only has two feature values and uh, only a one-dimensional space dimension, right? But uh, that keeps everything nice and simple. And uh, what you've seen by now is here these maps and this uh, spatial map. And then here we have the attention field and spatial selection field that sort of takes one object in the spatial map and then uses the retinal selection field to read out its features. Why is this important here to read out features? And we need this actually to transform our objects that we see in our egocentric space, right? We want to transform them to the allocentric memory space so that we can sort of form a memory trace at the right location. And for that, we need to transform from the egocentric to the allocentric space. And because that can be quite troublesome if you do this with these two dimensional representations and you might get a lot of binding errors here, the trick that we use here and also in the scene representation of Gaul uh, is we transform the retinal space only. So only the space representation gets transformed. And then we recombine it again with only the features values from this uh, two-dimensional field here. And this way, we can go from retinal to world space. And uh, this might be one of the reasons, actually, why people need to sequentially attend objects. At least that's one of our hypotheses that we have here, that this spatial transformation is actually costly. And this, this is why you cannot look at four objects and transform them all at the same time. So in order to really understand what's going on in the scene, you sequentially attend different objects in the scene 
and do the transformation sort of one by one. That's our hypothesis. And then we, as you can see here, this is labeled memory gate. There's also some mechanism when uh, objects are actually uh, contributed to memory and when not, but I won't go into detail on this here. I rather want to show you a video of this whole mechanism. So forget like with the architecture I just showed you in mind, this is basically the same thing again, just in video form. Let me start this so we get a nice resolution here. So uh, back again, here below we have the spatial map. So basically the two objects are represented here. And here on the right hand side, we have the space and color map. So the same objects, but now with the color feature here below. And here we have the spatial selection field and here the retinal selection field. So the first thing that will happen is, and I let this run for a bit, one object will be selected here in the spatial selection field. And this causes then again here this rich activation. So only the right object will be selected. And then we can read out that this is at the purple position. And here then happens this coordinate transform that I talked about. So if you think about this robot being here in this world, so along the line of cubes, then the yellow cube would be here, the very leftmost position, and some cube that's not visible here would be the rightmost position. So if the robot is looking here, right, this is about right for, for this uh, purple object. So it's right in the middle of the allocentric space, maybe a bit to the right. And we use then this allocentric space information together with the color information from this retinal selection to form here a, a peak through the conjunction of these two ridges that we can then enter into memory here. So uh, I don't know if it was, uh, if you were able to see this, this thing here just emerged. The other three were already there. These correspond to these three objects here. And uh, this is the way sort of we get these memory representations in allocentric space from the camera space. And now it will sort of select uh, the leftmost object. And uh, then you can see the whole thing again. So left is, uh, here selected, this forms here a peak, and then it pops up here as a blue object in allocentric space. Uh, and then I think it's doing this another time, but that should be enough because the, the whole mechanism is just stolen from the scene representation. So there's nothing entirely new, maybe just a different perspective on this. Um, so can I get to the next slide? Ah, okay. That was perception and memory. And what I want to show now is uh, intention and action and prior intention. And for this, I chose here this driving because uh, actually driving here in this example amounts to going from left to right or from right to left to some position, right? So it's very simple to the hand left right example that I already showed in the beginning. And because this is the intention and action here, it has exactly the same components as I showed before, right? So here we have a drive intention node that gives us sort of the uh, position where we want to be in this horizontal world space. And then we have a condition of satisfaction representation here uh, that sort of compares this intention here uh, with something from the sensor surface and then triggers the condition of satisfaction. So these four fields here or these two nodes with the two fields, it's exactly the same pair as I showed before. And the thing that I didn't talk about in the introductory example was where the target position actually comes from, right? We don't know uh, where to go with our uh, vehicle here. And uh, the way this works here in this scenario is that the agent actually remembers locations of the different blocks. And if it wants to go somewhere, it recalls that block and then forwards this recalled position to this drive intention field, right? So that is forwarded here. The recall position is somewhere estimated here to the left where you cannot see it. <laughs> And it's then forwarded to, to some kind of gate here into the drive intention field. And this gate here, similar to the drive and the conditional satisfaction node, they are all governed by something that is labeled here locate. And uh, this will uh, come in uh, soon. So locate is so, is, so uh, the overarching behavior that the agent is doing. So in order to locate uh, is actually sort of a hierarchical action. In order to locate, it needs to first remember where the object is, go there, and then look for that. And the rest here below is basically just the implementation. Uh, I won't explain this, so this is just some action here to generate something for the wheel motors. And here we just get information from the uh, world sensor and uh, then can use this sort of to determine the condition of satisfaction. So uh, some implementation details. But what I want to talk about is this uh, 
locate behavior here. So if you look in the more higher scheme of things, so if you look outside of this drive behavior, but more on the hierarchy, hierarchy here of actions, then as I said before, uh, before we can drive somewhere, we need to recall the position. And when we drove somewhere, we then can visually search for whatever we wanted to locate or what the agent wants to locate. And what you can see here again, or what we should interpret this as is that this is again an intention node, and this is a condition of satisfaction node from the intention action to recall. And this here is the intention node for visual search and the condition of satisfaction node for visual search. And these are connected here by these precondition nodes. Uh, I think you also had these right, uh, already in the Wednesday lecture. Uh, so what these do is by connecting a condition of satisfaction to the intention in action of another action is that only if this condition of satisfaction is fulfilled and active, it will inhibit the precondition node that previously inhibited this drive thing. So it's sort of double inhibition. That's like activating something, right? Minus minus <laughs> is the plus. So um, this is the way you can sort of autonomously generate a sequence of multiple actions by using these uh, intention and action and conditional satisfaction nodes and then uh, connecting them through this precondition thing. And uh, all these nodes that are in play here, they are sort of activated by the on the higher level locate behavior. And because it's a, it's a hierarchy, they all work the same, right? So locate also has a condition of satisfaction that here gets activated to the visual search. And you could also imagine that after locating something, I also want to do another action, for example, reaching for something, right? So here uh, we have a precondition node that's actually uh, connecting locate and reach. And you can see here already by this collect that the whole locate action is actually part of the higher level action collect, so to speak. So this is how you can form using intention and action and condition of satisfaction node, you can really form these hierarchies of actions and then unfold uh, yeah, really these sequences. And again, I have a video for this. So uh, let me maybe explain its parts first. So this video is about uh, collecting a particular color and collecting is basically locate plus then reaching and locate entails like uh, recalling, driving and then searching for it. So this graph here is uh, was somewhat weird if you follow the arrows. Here is the collect thing starting by specifying a height and a color that I want to collect. Then here are these recall fields uh, that then sort of specify the drive target. Then here's the condition of satisfaction drive field that once this is active, it will trigger sort of a visual search. And once this condition of satisfaction for visual search is triggered, a reach will be, uh, will be starting. And, um, yeah, I will stop at some point. So first, two peaks will emerge here in the collect fields, and they will sort of be a rich input here for this uh, recall, and that will then result in this drive target here. So uh, maybe to explain how this peak is going to is to be read again, the world space is here is left and here is right. So the target here should be purple and large. So uh, if you have seen these figures <laughs> for as long as I have, you immediately know okay, this, this purple large block here that's our target actually or the location of that block and now you can compare here the current position which is coming from the sensor surface with our target and they overlap here in the condition of satisfaction drive once the robot starts moving the position changes right and then at some point there's an overlap that will form a peak and once this peak forms peaks form here through the precondition mechanism in the visual search color and height fields and if you now look here at the condition of satisfaction with the search, once that is triggered, uh, the intention to reach will start actually. So, um, and then the robot arm begins to move towards its single target here. So what this was supposed to show is really how this is all in continuous time, but these detection decisions sort of when there is a match between the intended and the uh, current state, then we get these discrete states, sort of this condition of satisfaction states, and these are the instabilities then that drive these sequences, right? So even though it's all in continuous time, this enables us to get sort of these discrete uh, points in time where we need to switch from one behavior to another. And this was, I think, now intention and action and prior intention. And what I want to talk about now for the rest of this talk is about the autonomous learning part of the project. Uh, that was sort of the, the 
the most on top thing that we added there. The rest was rather integration of uh, old stuff that we had already. So this is the stuff that's supposed to be new. And uh, by autonomous learning, maybe I should first explain, we mean learning really from your own experience, right? Because learning, especially nowadays with neural fields, is usually considered as, okay, you have a lot of examples, a lot of data, and then you can learn from that. But what we really mean by autonomous learning is the way that humans do without supervision. They have to do their own actions and generate their own experience and therefore learn from that, right? And that comes with a lot of problems, not only two, but these were the ones that uh, we discovered first. So, and one was, how can we abstract sort of from these uh, immediate perceptions and memories that we have to a more abstract form? And how can we organize the whole learning in time? And to be frank, the contact abstraction part, we still haven't done really uh, sophisticatedly. So it's very simple here. But the temporal organization, this is where a lot of time and effort went into. Uh, so what does it mean for this agent to learn in this environment? So the idea is to learn from a single episode already the rule. So an episode would be the agent collects some code, for example, purple, applies it to some canvas, for example, here a yellow one, and then receive, receives a result color here in blue. And from this forms then one coherent belief, so one entity that it has then stored in its belief memory. And the idea is then that you can then cue these beliefs to guide your behavior. So you're like, mm -hmm, I want to have something blue. And then you can remember, ah, I have a belief about that. This whole belief is I need purple and yellow. And then you can sort of, uh, get these collect behavior, for example, that we had before, where we collected first a purple object, and then later we will sort of paint on a, a yellow object to receive the blue one. And what we also uh, wanted to have, because beliefs often can be faulty, we wanted to be able to reject some beliefs in the face of conflicting evidence. What I mean by that is, if you think about, uh, you have some uh, action, the robot is, uh, again, collecting from purple, applying it to yellow, but then observes a cyan color instead of the blue one. And that's not as expected. And the agent should be able to at least notice that what is happening right now is contradicting the belief that we had that guided our action, right? So this is sort of the use case. And this is the architecture that should realize all this. And uh, it looks again, probably really horrible with a lot of parts and connections. So I try to go through this step by step but uh, yeah, don't worry if, if the details might not be as clear. So uh, what is, uh, are the main components? So the heart of this architecture is basically uh, these belief nodes, B1 to Bn, they represent sort of one single belief. And the beliefs are about these different color concepts. So here we have uh, CO is coating colors, CA is canvas colors, and R are the results colors. So, if I have a belief that red on green results in blue, this looks here uh, in a connectionist way. This B1 is connected to the red code, is connected to the green canvas and to the blue result, right? That would be one belief. And let's say we already have a second belief as well. So blue on cyan is red, right? So this guy here is connected to the blue coating, to this uh, cyan canvas and to the red result colors. And what I now want to do in this example is, uh, let's just imagine the agent is acting out and is trying out a new color combination. And how does this affect sort of this belief subnetwork? And the main thing for this are these three role fields here in the bottom. They are sort of connected uh, bottom up and top down. So they receive sort of in all the uh, color information from the perceptual part of the architecture. And they can also be used later for the prior intentions to sort of guide the action. But we will just uh, think about the perceptual part here. So while the robot is acting, it will receive sort of the color information from the things it's interacting with. So the first thing is it will sort of pick up code color in blue. And this will then form a peak here. And these connections from the uh, color fields to these concept nodes you have seen probably in the visual search task in the workshop. So uh, when there's something blue here, it will activate only the blue node, right? And it goes in both directions. If the blue node is active, it will activate here 
something blue in the, the, the blue range here in this field. So now this blue node is activated. It is sort of has already this learned connection, and these go in both directions. They're reciprocal here, right? So uh, the same as these connections here. You can see at the, the small arrows here, hopefully. Uh, so what will happen here is that because we collected from blue, this might still be B2 because we only know, okay, it will be blue colored if collected. So B2 will also be activated. But what then happens as the agent decides to paint on a green canvas, it will activate this green concept node. And then this turns off uh, the B2 node because B2 is not connected to blue and green. And this is because uh, there's also a connection pattern here that goes from all concept nodes to all the leaf nodes, sort of an unspecific inhibition that uh, ensures that only beneath nodes can get activated that match sort of all the, all the concept nodes that are currently active. That's very important because you want to not overwrite beliefs that you already have. So if you would always overwrite an old belief, that would lead to catastrophic forgetting the more beliefs you learn. And this idea comes from uh, Carpenter and Grossberg and their adaptive resonance theory. So that's a, a similar network sort of that we took the inspiration from that exactly deals with this problem of catastrophic forgetting and provides sort of a, a way to get around this. Uh, so this is why now we have uh, like collected from here, applied on green, have these two concept nodes active, and then we observe our results that will be purple, and this will activate the purple concept node. And if we would have had this belief already, then this belief now would here be active now and would just be strengthened, everything would be fine. But in this example case, this is new, a new belief. So we need to make sure that these three concepts now get associated with one of the non-committed belief nodes, right? B1 and B2 are already used here. So we want to connect it to either B3 or something higher to, to the end. And uh, for this, we have sort of a second mechanism here that is also triggered by the results. It's called color change here, right? But the, what's really happening if a result is there, it's a color change happening. And that triggers here some boost. And I won't go into detail uh, much on this, but that boosts all the leaf nodes and also all of these second row of nodes, these commit nodes. And these commit nodes ensure basically that nodes that are already in connection here will not be activated. So they inhibit those and then some free node will be active. In this case, it will be B4. And then because this whole color change also uh, so, uh, sort of generates a reward signal here for this uh, Hebbian reward-based Hebbian learning rule that is in place between uh, all these concept nodes and all these belief nodes, uh, we will learn now a connection between the active nodes here. So B4 will be associated with all these three nodes here below. And similarly, also the, the uh, commitment node will be associated. Uh, that's important, but if you have questions on this, maybe ask me later in private and I'll surely explain it more. Um, to finish, I want to show one last video here uh, about how this belief architecture can then be used to really guide behavior. So um, here, uh, maybe I should explain what is now what. So here in the uh, below, we have again these three uh, role fields, right? This is the result color, canvas color, code color. They are here connected to these concept nodes. So I don't know if you can read this, but here is sort of each of these nodes represents one color. And then here in the top row, we have these belief nodes. And what we can now do is because these connections go both ways is we can activate uh, a certain result color and that will then form a peak here and activate a node, that node will then activate a certain belief. And from that belief, we can sort of get the missing parts of the puzzle. And this is what's going to happen here in this example. So one uh, peak will come up here, will sort of activate the node, this will activate a belief. And this, I hope you saw this, activated then these two concepts. So we then get the right code color and the right canvas color. So this is why all these uh, connections here need to go in both directions. So we can either learn, but we can also use the learned things to then guide this painting process. And here I fast forwarded this. So uh, the, the robot now searches for, uh, I don't know, I think the purple object, and then will hopefully receive yellow. I ah, know it will not receive yellow because that's also the example about the rejection. 
but I think I already went in a lot of detail here. Um, uh, maybe I could uh, explain this. I see I'm not that terribly about out of time. Uh, so uh, maybe I explain this as well. So uh, the idea here is that we have sort of a transient detector that detects w whether there's a condition of dissatisfaction between the result color here that we had first. So uh, here, while the uh, uh, agent was enacting, it expected a yellow result color, right? That was the original cue that also established this belief and got us to the belief that blue on purple yields yellow. And um, here at some point though, because this is still connected to the perceptual surface, when this change is going to happen, that the purple thing will actually turn cyan, uh, you would see here in the result color field that the cyan color the robot now observes overrides its original uh, result color, right? Because this one thing was just mental and things from the perceptual surface are always stronger. So this selective field here will be overridden. And so a change will happen in the result color. And this change is sort of picked up by this detector here, the condition of dissatisfaction detector. And that tells me then, or it tells not me, but the agent that the belief it had was overridden. So it will uh, deactivate this belief node and then associate the rule with a new one. Um, but yeah, I won't go too much into detail. The important part is rather that there is sort of this kind, kind of change detection here and that the perceptual part is still connected to this, right? So even though this is already high level beliefs, uh, we still have sort of the ongoing connection to the perceptual surface. And yeah, with this, I, I want to conclude. So what I hopefully showed you here was sort of a way how to get from the sensory motor surface in one architecture to forming these abstract representations. And you've seen process models of all the six different psychological modes, or maybe not, you haven't seen desire, but that's really looking right now still in its baby shoes. And uh, we're waiting on that. And then even if you didn't understand anything of the belief network at all, that's totally fine. You should at least notice from that that there was a lot of infrastructure just to get this very simple association from one node to three fields or something. And you need a lot of nodes to temporarily sort of organize that. So that's the, the take home message from the belief part. <laughs> and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them right now.